Our first speaker will be uh, George Burnujian. And he, is a, he has a PhD from UCLA. And he's held so many teaching positions. Senior professor of Eastern European and Middle Eastern history at Iona College since 1989. And he's occupied many important administrative posts, including assistant provost at Columbia University. He's a multilingual scholar, and I really mean multilingual. His fields of research include Iran, Armenia, Russia, and the South Caucasus. He's the author of 36 books and numerous articles and book chapters. Uh, his uh, textbook on Armenian history, A Concise History of, Arme of the Armenian People, has been translated into Spanish, Arabic, Turkish, Armenian, Russian, Persian, and Japanese. And I should add that um, I, for many years I've been using uh, Professor Bernstein's book in my Armenian history class, and it's especially interesting for my students when they see, I show Professor Bernutian in a documentary film, and my students are, they see the author of their textbook on the screen. That doesn't happen very often in courses. They're very impressed by that. And Dr. Bernutian, they, they like the way you speak to him. In addition to the content of your book, they love the way you speak. And with that, let me introduce the topic of Professor Bernutian's talk today. It will be on the transformation of Yerevan province, or Yerevan Khanate, uh, into the Republic of Armenia. Thank you very much, Dr. Marashlam, for the very kind and generous introduction. Uh, it's nice to, I'm retiring in, in a year and a half, and finally, I, cannot, I don't have to teach anymore, and I can concentrate on my other books, which I'm working on at present. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before my presentation, I would like to thank, really thank, the organizers of this conference, which has been pre prepared with meticulous detail. I have very rarely seen such a conference that is prepared in such fantastic, everything was done perfectly, for inviting me to present my recent research. In 1849, Prince Mikhail Varantsov, the Viceroy of the Caucasus, formed the Yerevan Gubernia, or the Yerevan province. I have given maps to some of you. I'm still farther behind at my age. I don't know how to use flash drives, and I don't even own a cell phone, so it's a little bit different for me. This Yerevan province, by combining the former Russian Armenian province, the Armianskaya Oblast, which was created in 1828 after the Russo-Iranian War by combining the Khanates of Yerevan and Nakhchivan with the Alexandropol district of the Tiflis Gubernia. On your map, it's A1 through 4. From that date, until the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the Yerevan province was the only province in the Caucasus, as well as the entire 89 provinces of the Russian Empire, where the Armenians formed the majority of the population. According to the first all-Russian census of 1897, which was the first reliable statistical data, the Armenians accounted for 53% of the population of the Yerevan province. By 1914, the Armenians formed 59% of the inhabitants. Despite the steady inflow of Armenian immigrants from the Ottoman Empire, the Armenian population did not increase significantly, mainly due to the fact, and this is what my research of the family numbers, that the Muslims, especially the Kurds, had larger family sizes than the Armenians. This is probably due to the fact that some of the Muslim men had more than one wife. It is important to note, however, that the Armenians were a majority in this Yerevan province in only three of the seven districts on your map, Alexandropol, Novobayazut, and Echmiadzin, 
while the Muslims formed a majority in the Surmalu, Nakhchivan, and Sharur Daralagyaz districts. In the Yerevan district, the Armenian population equaled that of the Muslims. It is important to add that when you look at the map, that it's the same three districts which had an Armenian minority. And of course, after the Turkish invasions, many are the few, not few, but the Armenian minority, many of them fled north and east. And it's the same districts that you see I have crossed out, which was severed from Soviet Armenia, unfortunately. One has to add that the Yerevan province was one of the less significant provinces in the South Caucasus, not having the political or economic stature of the Tiflis, Kutais, Elizabeth Paul, or Baku provinces. Many Armenian doctors, businessmen, authors, lawyers, and almost all of its intellectual political leaders preferred to live in the above cosmopolitan industrial and commercial areas, as well as in Russia, and not in the largely agricultural Yerevan province. In fact, most of them were not born in, had never lived in, or even had visited the province or the city of Yerevan. Therefore, most revolutionary, pre-revolutionary Russian studies, almost all of which were written in Russian and printed in Tiflis, focus, when you look at the books that are available at the time, Tsarist period, focused on the overall social and economic conditions of the Caucasus and on the Tiflis province, and not on the Yerevan province. After Sovietization, Soviet historians, both Armenian and non-Armenian, focused mainly on the changes which had occurred after 1921. They viewed pre-revolutionary Armenia with a great deal of justification, one may add, as a backward agricultural region which had only blossomed into an urbanized, industrialized, and progressive society under communism. The majority of scholars in the United States and Europe either concentrated on the classical and medieval periods, could not read Russian, concentrating their efforts on the Armenian literary and revolutionary movements in Turkey, Georgia, and Russia, or on the political history of the first Armenian Republic. They thus ignored or downplayed the 90-year history of Russian Armenia, which after all formed the core of the first Armenian Republic, the later Soviet Armenia, and the present-day Armenian Republic. I was certain that after the industrialization efforts and land reforms undertaken by Sergei Vite and Pyotr Stalipin in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the local Russian administration in the Yerevan province must have left some records, albeit in Russian, on the socioeconomic conditions of the province. After all, the opening of the Tiflis Alexandropol Kars Railway in 1899, the Alexandropol Yerevan train in 1902, and the Yerevan Julfa Railway in 1908 facilitated the integration of Yerevan province with the rest of the Caucasus and must have had a major effect on the socioeconomic conditions of the Yerevan province, especially on the cities of Yerevan and Alexandropol. I was also curious to find answers to the following questions. What was the administrative structure of the Yerevan province in the last years of imperial rule? How did the newly formed Armenian Republic manage to administrate day-to-day -day life between May 1918 and December 1920? How despite epidemics, lack of food, enemy attacks, inundated with over 300,000 refugees, was the government of this new republic run by a small group of very good-intentioned Armenians from Tiflis able to function? How did the Armenian Republic in less than 1,000 years of its, 1,000 days of its existence was suddenly able to create the education institutions, the courts, the prisons, the post-telegraph transportation systems, the army, the medical, the veterinary centers, the police, agriculture, irrigation, and administrative structure which maintained this republic. 
During my recent research trips to St. Petersburg, Russia, I was fortunate to find a complete set in Russian of the official imperial studies printed by the government in Yerevan, dealing primarily with the social and economic conditions of the Yerevan gubernia for the years 1900 to 1914. The reports contained the names of all the 1,295 Armenian villages, the number of Armenians and Turco-Tatars, which later became Azeris, there was no such word as Azeri until 1918 anyway, Turco-Tatars, Kurds, including the Yazidis, Assyrians, and Russian males and females in each town and in each village, the property ownership, taxes paid by each community, the number of domestic animals in each community, the type of farms and pastures, the type of agricultural products, the imports and exports, the names and ethnicity of the main administrators, police chiefs, doctors, court and prison officials, veterinarians, architects, district supervisors, irrigation supervisors, as well as the various train stations, the price of train tickets, the post and telegraph offices, and the cost of mailing letters and packages, and much, much more. My new monograph, the Yerevan province from 1900 to 1914, which will be available on Amazon starting on May 29th, includes all of this information. It's over 400 pages, some of which I will not bore you with all, I will share with you today. Although the governor and vice governor of the Yerevan province were Russian, they were both assisted by numerous, I have the names in the book, Armenian advisors and functionaries that included registrars, archivists, land surveyors, city engineers, statisticians, bookkeepers, many in charge of the official provincial printing press, fire department, the courts, tax collectors, and so forth. For example, Samson Ter Sahakyan was the senior advisor to the vice governor. His assistant was Hovakim Hassan Jalalyan. The department in charge of land tenure was administered by Levon Hassan Jalalyan, who was assisted by Sambatter Ghazarian. The city architect was an Armenian named Boros Keshishian, who supervised a number of Armenian, Georgian, and Russian technicians and draftsmen. The chief medical officer of the province was an Armenian called Zairamayr Andreasian, who directed Russian and Russian-speaking European health professionals. The chief veterinarian of the provinces was Vartan Torosian. He and his assistant Mikhail Mikhailian supervised a staff composed of Armenians and Russians. Thanks to the efforts of 20, 23 veterinary centers, the number of livestock, and the book has all the numbers of how many sheep, goats, etc. Okay, of the province increased considerably. Many of the local vets were Russian, local, but Armenians and a handful of Georgian and European vets worked in these centers. Yerevan had a slaughterhouse with Armenian and Russian veterinarians to inspect the animals and the meat. The city of Yerevan had a hospital whose director and the entire staff, except for one, were Armenian. Two doctors, their Hovanesian and their Avedisian, were in charge. There were Russian and Armenian midwives in main towns and in main villages. There were no Muslims in either profession. Yerevan also had an insane asylum. There were prisons in both Yerevan and Alexandropol, vaccinations for smallpox, an improved sanitary condition had reduced cholera, malaria, and scarlet fever epi epidemics, and had reduced the mortality rate. They have all that is in the book, the amount of births and deaths, etc. The mayor of Yerevan was an Armenian named Hovanes Melik Agamalian. He belonged to the same Agamalian Melik family that had been responsible for the Armenians of the city during the rule of the last Iranian Qajar governor and Sardar Hossein Goli Khan Qajar, 1807 to 1827. The mayor's office was composed primarily of Armenians with professional degrees 
members of noted families such as Melik Punyatov, Smehrabian, Sterhakopian, Saivazian, Sterhazarian, I can go on and on. The main things, most of whom had added OV, the Russian OV suffix to their surnames. There were no Muslims among these officials. The mayor of Alexandropol, the largest city of the province, was also an Armenian, Hovsepti Kranian. Since the city had an overwhelming Armenian majority, its entire council was composed solely of Armenians. Again, I have the names, I won't bore you. The mayor of Novobayazid was Stepan Patikians, as well as all members of that council were Armenian. Even in the districts on your map, the three districts, with Muslim majorities, the Armenians had members in every town council. All the police prefectures, and on the map, the police prefectures are in Roman numerals. Every district had two, three, or four police prefectures divided, districts. All the police prefectures in the Muslim-dominated districts were located in the Armenian villages, not in the Muslim villages. The police chief of the city of Yerevan was Armenian, Konstantin Arakelian. Both Armenians, however, and a few Azeris, Turks, served as secretaries, but mainly as interpreters, because there, many of the Tatars did not know any other language, so they needed a Tatar interpreter who could interpret it for the Russians. The police superintendent of Davalu was an Armenian named Melik Yaganyan, the chief of police of the city of Alexandropol, Alexander Markarian, his assistant, Grigorians. It goes on. The chief police of the city of Nobayazid was assisted by an Armenian called Ter Grigorian. Armenians and Russians were solely in charge of the train stations and the post telegraph system. By 1908, the Yerevan province had post and telegraph connections and rail with Russia via Tiflis, with Iran via Julfa and Urdubat, and with the Ottoman Empire via Alexandropol and Kars. The cities of the province, that is Yerevan, Alexandropol, Nakhchevan, Nobo, Bayazid, and Urdubat, as well as the towns of Vagarshapat, Irdir, Julfa, and Kakiris, each had a central post telegraph office. Smaller villages like Bashnorashen, Tarachicha, Kamarlu, Yerenovka had local police stations. The only way that Armenians were not in top positions was in the provinces, finance, and treasury departments. These were headed the top positions by Russians. However, the majority of the bookkeepers, accountants, assistants, were Armenians. Again, the book contains all their names in case you like to find some of your relatives. The official data for the year 1910 records 311 educational institutions with a total of 23,530 students, 18,097 males, 5,433 females. 90% of these students were Armenian. The Armenians of the Yerevan province had taken advantage of the upper level schools. In addition to Armenian, they learned Russian, some of them even learned French and German, and therefore, unlike the Turks, they were able to continue their education, professional education, outside the province because some of them went to Tiflis, some other places, as well as to obtain posts in the provincial administration. In fact, the records indicate that the majority of the few Muslim officials that were employed in the province could not speak or write Russian. Therefore, they were not used. Tsarist military sources I'm, I'm looking at those now too, unanimously agree that after the Turkmenchai Treaty of 1828, Russia did not anticipate any danger from Iran in the future conflicts. Therefore, out of the five military barracks, military stations in the Yerevan province, only one was located in the Nakhchevan district, which had a border with Iran. The other four were in Yerevan, Echmiadzin, Alexandropol, and Novobayazid bordered the Ottoman Empire, 
or were concerned with safeguarding Tiflis, the center of the Russian administration in the Caucasus. The tax records that I've examined of the province clearly indicate, and this is something I didn't know, that Muslim men in the Yerevan province, not in all the other provinces, were exempt from military service. In exchange, they had to pay a special army tax, and I have the exact number of the army tax for every Muslim village and the totals. The recruitment centers for the barracks were in the Armenian populated towns and villages. They were staffed by Armenian and Russian officers. Now, the Yerevan district had recruitment centers in the city of Yerevan and the village of Qamarlu. Echmiatsin had in Bagar Shapat, Ashtarak and Igdir. The Nakhchevan had in Nakhchevan or Dubat. Novo Bayazid had, the, had barracks in Novo Bayazid and Lower Akhti. The Alexandropol district, yeah, it will be done. The Alexandropol district, which had been the launching point for the Russian attack against the Ottoman Empire in 1877-78 Russo-Turkish Wars, became an, the most important military center after rail connections were established to, from Tiflis to Kars. There were five recruitment offices in Alexandropol, Karakilisa, Khorom, etc., etc. The Armenian draftees, therefore, learned the necessary military skills which enabled them to fight off the Turks in 1918. Armenian businessmen dominated Yerevan, and their cognac, wines, and canned goods sold all over Russia. They even placed advertisements in the newspapers and journals in Yerevan, Tiflis, and a few in Moscow. Kevor Khachaturov, who owned the Orient Hotel, notified his readers that his establishment was a first-class hotel with rooms starting at one ruble and 20 kopecks a night. I wish that was the case. The hotel had superb restaurant in the garden and an orchestra. The Ohanian factory, which produced canned apricots and crushed tomatoes, boasted that its products were sold in the imperial capital of St. Petersburg. An Armenian named Tatevosyan advertised his shop specializing in imported porcelain, crystal, and furniture. The brewing factory of Zanga, which was owned by Avetisians, publicized its beer. The Harutuna factory hawked its team products, while the Tatevos brothers advertised their sausage factory and store in Yerevan. A large store owned by the Gabrielans and Son sold weapons and samovars made at the imperial factory in Tula. Armenian barbers, hairdressers, florists, haberdashers proclaimed their shops and services. Armenian-owned bookstores, music stores, pharmacies, perfumeries, all claimed to have the latest European and Russian products. The Apollo cinema even had the latest silent films accompanied by an orchestra. Now, my reason for reciting this long list of names and positions is to demonstrate that the administration of the Yerevan province on the eve of World War I was staffed by a relatively small group of Russian officials with Armenians employed in all positions, even in some of the higher grades. Unlike the Turks and Kurds, the Armenians had embraced the Russian presence in the Caucasus. And as one scholar has pointed out, they had tried to lessen the, their outsider status within the imperial system. Following the Bolshevik Revolution, many of the high-ranking Russian officials left the Yerevan province. Their Armenian assistants filled their vacant post. Hopefully, this is subject for another research for some of the young people here but you need to start learning Russian. The arrival of the small group of Armenian politicians who left Tiflis on July 17, 1918 to govern Armenia must probably have caused resentment on the part of the local Armenians. That's also a subject of future research. The new government, totally unfamiliar with local conditions, had to rely on the organizational and technical experience and skills gained by the local Armenians, which was essential in running the day-to-day -day affairs of the Armenian Republic and probably played a major role in the early year of Sovietization, also for a future subject. My data proves conclusively that the Armenian Republic 
contrary to belief of some, was not created in a vacuum. It was not like the goddess Athena that emerged fully formed from the head of Zeus. I hope that future Armenian scholars learn the necessary language skills, take advantage of the availability of the newly opened archives to fill the lacunae of the socioeconomic history of Armenia from November 1917 all the way to 1923. In conclusion, after 100 years, it's time for us to reassess the accomplishment and the failures of the first Armenian Republic. Otherwise, we'll continue to meet in the diaspora, retread the old ground, nod to each other, and instead of learning from our past mistakes, repeat them. I leave you with the following statement. A serious historian has to state the facts without a political agenda or worrying whether it may challenge existing national mythology or sentiments. Thank you. This was the period when uh, the construction of the trains, which uh, Professor Bernutian uh, talked about, was any of the transportation of weapons, bombing equipment, and so forth, done by train? I have no idea. Because mine, mine, was, nothing to do, mine was nothing to do with the military or political. My work discusses the socioeconomic. I have the price of the ticket. Oh, I yes, knew yes. every station. I knew every station, the train stopped, but I generally did not look. At least I didn't find anything. In the documents that I found, it's all having to do with the socioeconomic conditions of the Yerevan province. This is the period where generally, of course, we know this, that Armenian revolutionaries, until Galitsyn started bothering the Armenian church crisis and a few other things that happened, Armenian revolutionaries concentrated all their activities, as my friend pointed out, on the Ottoman Empire. So the Russians, until Galitsyn and a few others began looking at Armenian revolutionaries, and most of them were in Tiflis. Yerevan province, as you very well, they all came from Tiflis, eventually most of them, to form their first Armenian Republic. The Yerevan province was not a den of revolutionary activities. About the population of Armenia, the percentage of Armenians in Armenia, how did that proportion change during the Republic? It's a very good question. I didn't go into it. I'm going to discuss that uh, in another conference, a whole different thing. Uh, during the Republic, we don't have the exact statistics because they, the Republic was struggling through so many things that they didn't have time. The 1897 census, the reason it's so accurate, the Russian Empire employed 15,000 clergymen, officials, military, to go to the 89 provinces. We have it, I have it at home, the entire survey. Of course, it's in Russian. It tells you every district, how many Armenians, Assyrians, Russian, in all the Caucasus. What changed, if you look at the map, not that it's very pleasant, but after Surmalu, the district where Mount Ararat, and Nakhchevan and Sharur was severed from Armenia, those were the minority areas. Many Armenians during the invasion, as Dr. Hovanesian points out in his books, move north to seek refuge in Alexandropol, Echmiadzin, and all the way to Novobayazid. But by the census of 1926, Soviet census, the next reliable census, Armenians are 84% of Soviet Armenia. So we lost the areas that had Armenian minorities. Not that it's wonderful that we lost them, but the result was that the population moved this way. 84 point some percent, I have it in the book, Armenians. And by the end of the Soviet Republic, Armenians were 94% of the population. It was the only republic in the Soviet Union, the next one is Moldova, that had such a majority of one 
ethnic group. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to see so many of my former students on the program for these two days. But Harsus um, Georgina. George is one of my first PhD students and has done wonderful work. Um, Watch the Chigain Ashka Dogner, the Sanazan Department Neru Merch. El Chigain, I'm busy answer, Vonok Navirvaza in Anka Kuchan Kagaparin. Yeah, in the criticism of the internal ministry of, our, of Armenia at the time, it was not that there had not been. Uh, a bureaucracy. In fact, there had been a very strong bureaucracy. Uh, and the criticism coming from the left, coming from the revolutionaries within the ARF and within the Socialist Revolutionary Party, etc., was that these were the, the chinovniks. These are the people who were there uh, to be bribed, to be uh, uh, bureaucrats. And the, the question is to create a generation just as it is today, to create a generation that are dedicated to the concept of new independence. And I think that was going to take time, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it because they didn't have time to create that generation, just as we perhaps have that same thing now. I just want to say that, and, and uh, thank you. I think these, uh, both of these talks today show us sort of cutting edge kinds of uh, research that is being done uh, uh, with the uh, new resources. Thank you. The gentleman back there. Uh, yeah. This question is directed to Dr. Burnutjan. You kind of ended on a cryptic note uh, about some people say something to the effect of uh, the, the Republic was born like Athena out of Zeus's head. I like that one. Um, huh? I'm using the Greek, not the Roman versions. Thanks, yeah. Caro. Um, the, the, the question I have it is that meant as a counterpoint to Vratsian's comment about it, the Republic being created out of Ansev Chaos, or Chaos. is this something else? Could you just elaborate on that notion? No, it wasn't political. The reason is that, as Dr. Hovanesian pointed out, there were, the way I've looked at it in my age period when I was studying, we suddenly are, we don't go into the details. It's not anybody's fault. We don't go into the details of the day-to-day -day activities of the Republic. As Dr. Ovanesian says, they didn't have time. The way it's approached, suddenly May 28, and it wasn't really May 28, where we can debate the date some other time. Uh, May 28, we have this Republic and celebrating independence of Armenia, fine. How did this republic function? Yes, we had the leaders coming. Who was in charge of the hospitals? Who was in charge of the vets? Who was in charge of the prisons? This part is missing. What I meant is one has to examine and not to just think that the republic was suddenly born in a vacuum. There was a huge foundation. Yes, most of them were chinovnikis, the functionaries, of the Russian Empire, and most of them spoke Russian very well, and many of them probably did not have the hockey of the new revolution to create a country, but they were there. You couldn't discount them. If you wanted to go to the hospital, the doctors did not move from Tiflis. By the way, I have found out in another research that 38% of the doctors in the city of Tiflis were Armenians. How many of those doctors left the beautiful Tiflis to come to dusty Yerevan full of epidemics and starvation? So if you got sick, you had to go to the hospital which was there before. That's all I was trying. It was nothing cryptic. I didn't try to make it political at all. As you know, I don't belong to any political party. Professor Burnutsanin. Yerevan Nahangum Him neither vets, apaga, Hyots Peta Council, Vera Kangavets. Versin Shajanum, Hastanum, Merlusau King Gernates, Pavel Chobanan, Usumna Sirsuner, Aredvor, 
Ne ben ki miyane şanak çıpti, asen ki vur, ne pas tavores, Rus hastanı kaga kakanıtsın, jor tağrakan imastof, hayrin ait hat vatsum hava kelut esan künits. Kidek merharevanın nasme vur, arevelan Ayastan Irak'a mesamet iperte aremetzan Azerbaycanne. Hıma, bayt stuka in karşı kincek vur, ben ki petke verana enk müs nahang neri hartsum masna vur. Pes yev nüniz kerevanı nahangi aranzin hat vatsın, pes surmalı yanın da dukçist neşetsik, nahçevanı hat vatsıçe. Bu Rusakan kaga kaga insanı ira kaga insan meç İslam açman naif uğutsune unetsel yev bakvi rubai mius nahangneri harcum şatel İslam açman kaga kaga insanı rev hayrin turşma gelu masna vurapes karşı marzı meyas ne rutseto yotanas nuttuva kanin hatuk vuruşu megel hayri dega poxutsun aynter arkelelu vera beral. Xentrum emzel karşı. Şey şat işte karşım var Anglenov patsatem. Uh, you are absolutely right. There was a policy of the Tsarist government and even later the Soviet government to, they preferred in some cases, yes, the centers were in the Armenian villages, etc. But when you read it, they did not trust the Armenians because the Armenians were educated. They preferred to work with the less educated Muslims. They could control them much better and some of this forced immigration happened during the Tsarist period and later during the Soviet period. You are absolutely correct. Just a sec. At this time, Hima Jamanakne, Archivnere, Nor Archivnerka, Yerdasart Musanornere, Hima Jamanakne Boris Ksen, as Nor Archivnere, Arachut Slavnayel, Hotvats Nerkarel. Because we are not finished yet. We are very young. And the new republic is very young. The Soviet archives are there. The KGB archives in Yerevan, some of them may be open. Some already in Soviet Union are open, some. It's time to look what was the role of the Communist Party. What did they do? What kind of direct directives came from Moscow? Secret directives, not the ones that we know. How did they view the republic down deep, not on the surface? It's time.